Hi, my name's Ed from Cyvex, and this week on Cyvex Says we're talking about superchargers and turbos. So very quickly, let's explain the difference. A supercharger is driven by exhaust gases that leave the engine. These, uh, the exhaust gases are funneled through your exhaust manifold, eventually end up in a, in a kind of pointed into a nozzle that spins around a pair of exhaust blades, um, if you like a turbine, and then this is connected via a shaft within the turbo to a compressor turbine, and then this is what forces air into the engine. Obviously, this system works well, it's used everywhere, but it's not the only way. So let's talk about a supercharger as well. The difference between a supercharger and a turbo is a supercharger is directly driven off the engine. Uh, the crankshaft that spins around in the engine is connected to your gearbox, um, your ancillaries, also has an, usually another belt off that which is connected to the supercharger. So the supercharger is always spinning um, when the engine is spinning, it's, uh, it's directly coupled and this offers a, certain, a few certain advantages. Firstly, if you have a turbo um, and you're uh, let's say you, ex you open your accelerator as, quick, as quickly as you can. There's a sudden rush of exhaust gases, not instantaneous, but a sudden increase in exhaust volume that has to spin the turbo round. And the turbo is obviously, it's made of metal. It has a certain weight behind it. And this takes a certain amount of time to catch up with the engine. Um, this lag, if you like, um, affects response time of a turbo compared to when you open the throttle and you wait for a few moments for the turbo to start working and producing the extra airflow that the engine needs to make its power. The supercharger is almost the opposite of this. As soon as the engine is changing in RPM or the RPM is increasing or whatever, the supercharger is, has already matched that engine speed. It has to. It's physically connected to it. So if you increase the engine RPM, the supercharger is already working straight away. Um, there are also different approaches to how these two work. Um, traditionally, a supercharger is what we call a positive displacement uh, supercharger. And what this means is it literally grabs a volume of air and forces it into the engine. Um, we'll put a diagram here to kind of explain this, but it really does, it grabs, say it might be a litre of air, forces it into the engine, and the idea is to make more engine, uh, more air enter the engine is you have the supercharger spinning faster than the sort of volume of available in the engine. So by its nature, it has to compress it. Um, and this is interesting because it can produce a situation which you get boost very rapidly. Um, you don't have turbo lag, and it can produce also boost at a lower RPM where a turbo doesn't have enough exhaust gases passing through it in order for the turbines to become efficient and start producing boost. Um, there are downsides to a supercharger because you kind of think, okay, well, that sounds great. I want a supercharger now. There's virtually no lag as such. Um, and that is they're not as efficient. If you have, let's say we'll pick an engine, a hundred horsepower engine, whatever. Um, you can have a supercharger attached to that engine and you might end up making 150 horsepower. Uh, so great, the supercharger is added horsepower. However, it also consumes a lot more. Um, very kind of visually um, or noticeably if you're watching your fuel consumption, for example. So your supercharger that's now added 50 horsepower to that engine may be actually consuming 75, um, or the engine will actually be producing up to say 75 more. So let's say without the supercharger at that power, your engine will be doing 175 horsepower. You're actually only seeing 150. So the rest is power consumed simply by compressing those gases at the air charge as it goes through the supercharger. Turbos are kind of similar, but they don't have the so obvious effect um, of these losses. They are still there. Um, they're present in the fact that as the exhaust gases leave the engine, they're forced through a nozzle. That nozzle causes a restriction in the air leaving the engine. If you've ever tuned an engine by changing your exhaust and air filters, everything you're doing is to try and increase the amount of air flowing through the engine. And with a turbo, you're essentially putting that down to a nozzle, and that nozzle is going to restrict it. 
So this comes into, I think, one of our previous videos about matching the correct turbo for your engine and application. You don't want that nozzle too small, because if you do, that's going to restrict the power as the RPM increases. Conversely, if you have that nozzle too big, then what that will do is it won't have enough air velocity as it enters the turbine, and you'll end up with a turbo that, as we said before, simply isn't responsive. Um, so what we often see is superchargers are fitted to applications where you need a decent mid-range torque um, and acceleration, very nice throttle response, very predictable be because you know always what the supercharger will be doing versus the engine speed because they're joined together and that gives for a real nice driving experience. But they're not the best for top end power. So this is where things get interesting. Um, in the Group B rally car era, 1980s, um, there are, uh, manufacturers were playing around at combining both together. Uh, Lancia Delta S4 is a serious car. In the 80s, Lancia were practicing or, or experimenting with the use of a supercharger and a turbocharger on the same vehicle. They wanted the ultimate in top end power and they wanted the acceleration get up and go that any supercharger can give. Um, these two working together created a system which we now call a compound charged. And this is where you have a supercharger at the low end producing um, the extra airflow required for the power response that then it changes over by clever arrangement of air valves and bypasses and so on to then operate in the region of a supercharger, uh, the, the turbocharger. Um, these are exciting vehicles to drive. I've, I've, I've never driven one. Um, I've never even seen one in the real world. Unfortunately, they're now hyper rare. And um, if you ever see one, yeah, yeah, I think you'll be impressed. But have a look on, on for videos or whatever. The Dell Stress 4 is a mean machine. Um, so this technology is something that we can now offer with Cyvex as well. So this does relate to our own hardware and products in the sense that we can do bypass valves. There are right ways and wrong ways of doing these systems, in my opinion. Um, we're not going to cover those exactly now, but it's, a, it's an interesting aspect to combining both technologies together. Um, when you just want to make more real life day to day compromises, however, um, superchargers generally get a worse mole per gallon uh, simply by the nature. They're always spinning, they're always driving the load. Um, by their nature, they're not as efficient. And um, that's why you kind of don't see them that often. Um, I th they're probably more expensive as well at mass produced levels. Um, so going back to turbos, they're everywhere. The, the, the technology there is such that even on small engines, I've got a small engine Golf that has a supercharger, a turbocharger on that. You know, that's fine for day to day use. And there's one other type of supercharger actually I'll come on to. This is a, um, a kind of a hybrid. So although this is traditionally a supercharger, as I explained earlier, is a positive displacement, literally grabs a volume of air, shoves it in an engine. But there are also centrifugal superchargers. Um, and they're kind of halfway sort of between a supercharger and a turbocharger. They're essentially the turbocharger compressor side attached to a gearbox um, and then driven by belt from the engine. So in these cases, you kind of have the response of a supercharger with sort of more efficient of a uh, the, the efficiency of a turbo. Um, they tend to give um, a boost curve that increases as RPM goes, so they're slightly different in their power delivery. If you've, if, and I have driven these, if you've ever driven one with a supercharger like this, they do feel like they're going to keep going and going and going. Um, they are more compact, um, but they're not necessarily what you want from a supercharger if you're looking for that instant throttle response at low RPM. Uh, they, they can't grab the air in the same way a positive displacement supercharger can. They still need the compressor blades and the engine RPM to be such that the turbine, uh, the compressor becomes efficient and can grab that air and force it into the engine. But the future is interesting with these. The to technology is always evolving. Oh, and one other thing to add. Um, superchargers can make some strange noises. By, by their nature of being a positive displacement supercharger, um, 
they kind of, uh, they suck in air and it goes through the supercharger and kind of pulses. Um, and some people have referred to this almost like sounding like a cow or something like that. They do vary. There's different types and obviously different vein configurations within a supercharger. But as an example, I own a 1989 Nissan March Super Turbo that has a supercharger and also a turbocharger. And um, when I first got this thing, I took off the air box and put a free flow air filter on it, all the normal kind of stuff. And uh, the noise that the supercharger used to make was quite hilarious. Um, as always, if you have any questions uh, relating to anything uh, in this video, or as it's brought up any questions you'd like to ask us, drop them down in the messages below. Um, we'll respond and come back to it perhaps in a future video. Um, as always, uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and follow. Um, and uh, we'll, yeah, we'll see you at the next one.